This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster, and this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. Today we're going to review a Lower Deck Season 4, Episode 6, Parth Ferengi's Heart Place. <laughs> but first, we have news. I think the biggest news is that I'm still listening to the Strange New Worlds musical episode soundtrack. <laughs> It, that that's eternal, I think, at this point, right? And now it is eternal, yes. It's every day, and there's lots of singing. But in other news, we are always finding more tiny little tidbits about what could be the next Star Trek movie. And this week is no different. Right. Like last week, we talked about how one of the original screenwriters said the movie is, quote, like on track, still on tracks or something like that. She said still on the tracks, which on the tracks. I made fun of a little bit. This week, it got a little more serious because, you know, the WJ strike ended. Variety was reporting on all sorts of stuff that are happening across Hollywood now that the strike's over. You know, studios want to get things going again, of course. And there was almost an aside in one of their articles where they just said, Paramount is hoping to have writers fine-tuning scripts for its planned reboot of Star Trek and an adaptation of Rainbow Six to get both into pre-production, quote, soon. So... They were not specific about which writers might be doing this fine tuning. Right. I mean, it could be, you know, uh, there was been there's been two rounds of writers on this. I would not writers tend to kind of come and go. I would mm -hmm. not be surprised if there's yet another set of writers on this one. Sure. I mean, as I keep saying, Paramount wants to make a Star Trek feature film. They, they're paralyzed with how to do it, but there's no lack of desire. They've got the money. It's one of their big franchises. They know that they, you know, need to put out Star Trek feature films. There's politics, there's creative differences, there's competing projects, but they want to do something for sure. And they're trying. So we'll see what happens. She also, one of the other things Lindsay Anderson Beer said was that she said the idea for the story of the one that she worked on came from J.J. Abrams, who had said to Esquire earlier this year, uh, that that it's the first time that he felt they had a story that felt as compelling as the first Star Trek movie. So, but he's talking about his own story, I guess. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, story, I mean, as you know, story by is a technical term from the WGA. Who knows if he would right. get a, a story by credit? You know, she sounds like the kernel of an idea. It could be a single sentence, like, right. like Captain Kirk fights Jesus or something. <laughs> Which we know has been an idea. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Apparently, the you know, at least as of last year, the Lindsay Beer script turned into some other like Marvel writers came on. That was still the movie. So she would still get credit, you know, you know, especially franchise movies, you know, when they show the writers and there's like six writers. It's usually because there's various teams that came in and right. went, but they all got a piece of it. And all those things are very carefully negotiated, specifically and carefully. So it's likely, especially if it's a JJ idea that he seems to think is really cool, um, it's probably still that idea. Just, you know, going through more and more versions. Does that mean we're back to Kirk's dad? Maybe. But I think <sighs> I think we would have heard by now if Chris Hemsworth is attached to this project because that's such a big deal. Yeah. You know, when JJ was talking about how what a great idea was, Chris Hemsworth, I think, was out there saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I would do a Star Trek movie. So he's. Didn't seem to have talked to JJ in a couple of years, so I don't think so. I hope not. But you know, I'm 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 excited for the 2025, 20, 26 Star Trek movie, whatever. The yeah, fuck we'll that see. That is. I mean, I would love to see something totally different. I've talked about how I'm not super interested in the movies, but I say surprise me. Sure. So I think so much of the news this week is coming from a single source, Sir Patrick Stewart. Ah, uh, yeah, Sir Patrick Stewart. He's got a memoir out. Just came out this week. Called Making It So. <laughs> you um, know, I mean, if a Star Trek actor is doing a memoir, they've got to Trekify the name. Even if 10% of the book is about their time on Star Trek and the rest is, you know, their childhood and everything. They're going to Trekify the name for sure, right? Well, I don't, uh, Kate Mulgrew didn't. But when you have a catchphrase, <laughs> which he is the one, the one who does have a catchphrase. <laughs> I've gone on catchphrase rants before, but he actually did have a couple. Then that's there's no better one. I mean, you, you couldn't find a better title than making it so. And certainly the publisher is leaning into the, to it. I mean, they're sure. releasing <laughs> excerpts. All the excerpts are related to Star Trek. The interviews he's doing end up 
you know, making Star Trek news. So let's start talking about them. You know, let's stick with the theme of the movies. He talked sure. to w- Wired. And again, he mentioned how he wants to do a feature film again, which is something he said at New York Comic Con last year. And he's repeated this idea that he's ready to get back on the big screen as John luc Picard. But he's been very clear. He says there is not an official discussion about it. There's zero. But he's also had private conversations with people who are like, if you do it, I'm in. Yeah, he's probably talking about his TNG pals. Yes, of course. Not people at Paramount Pictures. You know, I I doubt Brian Robbins, you know. No, then that would be an official discussion. I think that's what the dividing line is. An official discussion is with the people who could actually make it happen. I think he's probably, you know, who knows? Maybe he's talked to Terry, too. Like, you don't, you know, we don't know who he's talked to, but it's people he would want to be creatively involved. Certainly. Yeah. When he talks about the idea, he has movie, he wants to see this kind of vulnerable, tested Picard, very, you know, which sounds a lot like Logan, if you think about that X-Men movie. But he also, I think, wants to see the TNG people. He doesn't want it to be all about him. Right. You know, you know I think there's has a close to 0% chance of ever happening on, on, on the big screen. Now, a streaming know, movie. Streaming movie? I, I'd give that a 27.5% chance of happening. I love that you're very specific in your numbers. Always. I've always thought I need to talk to Terry if he would accept the deal. But I think the most likely thing for Legacy, which we'll get into a little bit more, is for it to start as a ba- what they call a backdoor pilot, which would be a, a streaming event like right. they're doing with the Section 31 thing. Would be a smart way to go, I think. Yeah, I mean, the only problem is it's Star Trek. I mean, this gets into the weeds, but in the history of Star Trek, they don't usually do pilots. I mean, they certainly did with the first one, obviously, famously. Two. <laughs> right. Since and the, and the reason is, is shows like this, it's too expensive to do the standard pilot kind of thing. Right. Like you say, when you do, if you're going to build a ship set, you save money by using it in multiple episodes. Yeah. You know, I mean, the the. You know, famously, I think the the Voyager pilot was the most expensive pilot ever made, I think, until Lost came around or something wow. else, you know. But so at least turning it into a streaming movie event, you know, gives it a better shot. He also, Stewart also said he does expect that there would will be a TNG recasting reboot of some sort, which I've I've always thought is very possible yeah. within the next decade to see a new Picard, a new Riker etc. Agreed. I mean, the other thing I thought was interesting in that particular article was like he thought that the two aspects of Picard that he hadn't seen yet are Picard stumped and Picard truly fearful. And I think it's funny because we know the reason we don't see him stumped is because he's pretending to know the answer to everything. Like he well, told Beverly he saying, that. Wasn't he saying that there were elements of that within Star Trek Picard that he'd like to see on the big screen, the kind of stumped and fearful Picard were, we didn't see that on next gen, but we did see some of that on Picard. I think stumped. Was he stumped? Certainly fearful season two. And I think he was a bit flummoxed at times in season two. Well, flummoxed is different, but I, I mean, I'm not arguing with him. Like it's his character. And so he knows what he's played and what he feels that he hasn't played yet. So I'm not saying he's wrong, but I feel like that's, to me, it just brought up that it's always that scene in Attached that I always remember of Beverly realizing, oh, you don't always know what to do. You just pretend to know what to do. <laughs> and then, right. You, right, because you're the captain. And I love that. And I guess we've seen him afraid. Yeah. But it's always for short periods of time. Like he's, we've seen him physically, if, like a next gen, we've seen him physically afraid a couple of times. And we also saw him, I'm thinking, and I haven't watched it in a long time, but the one with like Nella Darren, was that her name? The woman that he dated for a while? I can't remember. She was a crew member and she had the piano, the rollout piano. And they, and when she was missing, I think he was fearful. But it's, it. I think maybe the point is he's always, his character always had to hide those things. So maybe it's about seeing those qualities more exposed. Patrick Stewart is an actor and he wants to be challenged as an actor. Yeah. And- Stuff like this is more nuanced. I mean, we saw some of that in season three, like the conflict he had with Riker, where he was clearly wrong 
Or was he right? Now I can't remember who was right in that situation, but they were both wrong because they were yelling at each other on the bridge. They were yelling uh, things like, <laughs> we're all going to die. <laughs> You've killed us all, dude. Yeah. <laughs> One idea he has is that his son would play Jean-Luc Picard in a next gen. I just don't see that. You know, I mean, if you're going to do it, you can just get the equivalent of Chris Pine, whoever that is, for John Luke Picard, except it'd be more middle aged person, probably someone in his 40s, maybe late 30s. So Chris Pine. Um, <laughs> so Chris Pine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Why I do not, think, you know, shave his head, you know, not, let's see what happens. Um, it could. Chris Pine can play all the captains. Um, I do <laughs> think that's very sweet that he said it could be his son, though. Yes, absolutely. So another thing, this is from the book, an excerpt where he describes the ending he had in mind for in Star Trek Picard. Right. Instead of that poker scene, he had a whole different thing going on. <laughs> Do you want me to describe it? Sure. Okay. So he, he, he said the writers came up with a lovely scene, by the way, but he thought that it would take place at his vineyard, at Jean-Luc's vineyard, and we see him from the back and it's dusk and his dog is there. And then we hear a woman's voice from off screen saying, Jean-Luc, supper's ready. And we're supposed to wonder whose voice it is. But Sonny, his actual wife, was going to record the lines. Right. And I guess the reason I'm laughing while I describe it is because I just can find many things wrong with that idea. And I'm glad they didn't do it. I mean, besides the fact that he's just sitting there and someone else is making his supper. Right. And that his wife would record. the. There's just a lot of things going on there. I mean, <laughs> on one hand, though, I mean, I love the poker scene, but it is just an homage in the end. And this show was to be an exploration of Jean-Luc Picard as a character. And his arc really does finish with him content and happy in his version of this. And it does finally pick up on the whole point of season two, which is the ability to form relationships, leaving the is it Laris or Beverly thing is annoying. I don't like that. Bringing in his own wife again is a bit of nepotism. Um, and he, he already brought her in once in season two. So Terry made the right call. Yeah, but I, I get what he's after. But in a way, this is the again, actor, you know, the, we saw this with Shatner, you know, where they start conflating the character with the act, you know, with themselves. And he's really trying to Patrick Stewart Picard and, you know, and how he's found love in the last decade of his life. I'm not saying this is his last decade, but in the last decade, because he <laughs> married Sonny right. 10 years ago. And he wants to share the love with the titular character. I get it, but I, I'm glad they didn't do it. Right. Same. I get it, and I'm glad they didn't do it. What else came of came from the – oh, there was, a, there was a nice – he recorded the audiobook, of course, because it would be weird if someone else did. And also, like, I mean, I, I think a lot of us would be happy to just listen to Patrick Stewart read the Starbucks menu. Like, Yeah. I think there should be a version read by William Shatner, though. I think that would have been <laughs> – They should do each other's. Right. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a story you've probably heard about how, you know, in season one, he was basically had a stick up his butt and, you know, he called a big meeting to tell everyone they were out of control and ran off in a huff to his trailer in Britain. Jonathan had to come in and say, dude, you know, mellow out. And, and he did. And he was glad for it, you know, which is yeah. nice. Yes. People don't have to get along on set. There's plenty of shows where someone comes in like Patrick did in season one and never kind of gels with his pals and those shows can be successful but i don't think things would have endured like they have if he maintained his kind of royal shakespeare attitude through the entire run it would have been a different show i'm curious what it would have been like yeah it would have been very different and i also think you know a lot of that is also dude like these people were somehow meant to come together and be great friends because their friendship and has endured all this time and it's still strong and powerful. And I think a big deal is how, if you look at like Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner went to him to talk about it and he said they were tactful and wise and reassuring. So he was with the right people. And of course, like we all know anyone who's on a set with Jonathan Frakes is a happy person unless they're just jealous that everyone loves him so much. That's part of it too. It's like you have Jonathan Frakes coming in who has this great attitude and is like, we're going to fix it, but I'm, but it's going to be a nice conversation. And they turned it into a good conversation. And this is 1987. These people didn't even know each other no. at all. Yeah. It's good that they turned it around 
quickly because it could have become a problem. Yeah. There was, you know, another excerpt came out where he talks about Nemesis criticizing the movie, uh, which, you know, I think. Thank you. <laughs> um, calling it a weak story. And yep. <laughs> What's funny is he says he didn't have any interesting scenes to play. I mean, ask you know all the other actors. Ask Marina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if anyone had any, int- I mean, Brent had the most interesting scenes because he helped write the script, and uh, Tom Hardy had some interesting things. Uh, uh, Stewart had some thoughts on Tom Hardy. Well, I know that was fascinating. So Tom Hardy wasn't famous yet, but Patrick Stewart said that Tom wouldn't engage with any of them socially. That he said he wasn't hostile. He just was either on set doing his scenes or he was in his trailer with his girlfriend. And on his last day, he just left and didn't say goodbye to anybody. Yeah. I mean, Tom was very young. I think he was doing drugs at the time. He's talked right. about how he had a lot of problems. And, you know, apparently the bomb of that movie sent him into a spiral. But obviously, and Patrick pointed out that he's done great work since and he's a big star now. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, speaking of the book, you actually went to the inaugural event of his book tour. I sure did. I went with Brian from Shuttlepod podcast. Um, We went, we had second row center seats, which was pretty amazing. Shout out to my dad, who's not listening to the podcast for the tickets. (laughs) Whoopi Goldberg was the moderator. They had a great discussion about his book. It was it's nice to see him so thrilled, like he's so excited about his book. And this was the big kickoff event. And he talked a lot. There were questions from the audience that had been submitted ahead of time. But Whoopi asked him about a lot of parts of his life. I thought he was very honest, like he talked about his divorces and said they were both my fault. And I hurt these women and my children very much like he owned it. And I feel like writing the memoir has been pretty cathartic for him. So he went through all this tough stuff to write it and get it all out. And now he's really enjoying being this guy who wrote a book. He never thought he'd write a book. So yeah. it was, the crowd was so thrilled and hanging on every word. And at the end, and I think he's doing this at every stop on the tour, he takes, he asks the audience, cause you get a book when you, when you buy a ticket. Um, and you get he asked the whole audience, like, hold up your books. And then he takes a picture of him with the audience behind him and everyone's holding up their books. I have to look at the one from New York, which I haven't done yet, because I had a little Riker up with oh, my book. Awesome. And we were in the second row. So let's hope it got in there. Now, by the time you listen to this podcast on Friday, if you're listening to it on the first day, there's still a few cities left. Cincinnati, Boulder. San Francisco, it's going to end on October 10th in Los Angeles. LeVar Burton's going to be the moderator. And I think he said they're sold out, except that you can uh, ticket for the online version of the LA one, I think he said. But otherwise, they're sold out. Visit PatrickStewartBook.com if you want more info. (laughs) And I just want to add that he was very excited that he was going to take the train to Philadelphia after the New York show. I mean, not that night, but (laughs) he was, he said as he was, as he was revving, he's like, I love the train with such excitement, like with this giddiness. And uh, I get it. I think that I think trains are great. I actually live next door to a commuter train that I take all the time, but I thought that was so cute. He was going to take the train and he's excited. I understand he said something about how um, he had to do many takes to get, he was being a perfectionist about the audio book. Yes. Many, many. (laughs) Many takes of redoing something until they were like, I think we're good. (laughs) But I mean, he is a great actor and he's a perfectionist and I could see him wanting to get it just right. And I listened to the excerpt that we have on the site. I'm not, despite the fact that my day job is at Audible, I'm not an audiobook person. But if I was going to pick one, I feel like that's a good one to pick. But I'm reading it. I am listening to it. I have the audiobook. I love audiobooks because I'm lazy and don't like to read. I don't think it's lazy. I think it's just how you take in information. Like, no judgment. I just prefer to read. And even as a kid, I didn't like being read to. I wanted to read things myself. I get it. Yeah. We've got another Star Trek legacy bit, as it were, out there, where Jonathan Frakes in the recent Star Trek Explorer magazine talks again about how he sees the show and his role in the show. He again suggests that he would play the Charlie and Charlie's angel thing, but he also suggests that maybe he's a captain still with his own ship. 
What do you think about that idea? I don't think that makes a lot of sense in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and, and how you do build it. another ship set that doesn't and, make any sense. Right, yeah. and seven's the captain, so how does that fit in? And what's the point of having two ships? It doesn't make a lot of sense. I love that he makes Charlie's Angels references, though, because he was on Charlie's Angels. <laughs> you know, he says that the season finale was basically a blueprint with Seven and Rafi and the LaVorge sisters and Jack Crusher. And he mentions Kestra and the actress who played her independente, who he thinks, who I guess Terry has said is at Starfleet Academy and I guess survived the Borgifying. Yeah. So, um, so well, she, Terry says almost everybody we like survived. Everybody, the everybody lived. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, legacy is not happening until it's happening, but it is definitely not happening as of now. Right. I've, I've heard nothing about any actual discussions about it. Right. It's not a real thing, but it's just something that a lot of people are talking about because they're trying to will it into existence. Exactly. Yeah, stranger, stranger things yeah. have happened. I, you know, again, I, I think that there's a chance for it to become this a streaming movie. I, I um, want to hear your stat. What's your number percentage wise? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is it's a tough one, uh, really, because so many planets need to align to make this happen. One of the problems is the Section 31 movie, which they're going to make, you know, that they're not that train is the, on the tracks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if that weren't happening, that would be the perfect time to just do it now. Right. Do it yep. this year. So you'd have to do it next year or the year after. Will everyone still be available? Will Terry want to do something that's scaled down that way? Or will he already be signed on with some other studio by that time? But I'm still like the 23.5% range somewhere in there. Would you know, what do you think? I mean, well, I tend to trust your percentages, but um I I think just broadly we have a timing problem that's been a problem with Star Trek for a while. I mean, if you think about it, COVID, then the strike. Everything's been much slower than it would have been with this. I mean, there's momentum right now. Where Will there still be momentum in one or two years? I don't know. That's a very good question. By that time, assuming they go forward with the Academy show, that's going to be the focus of the studio to move things in that direction. Um, and if it does well, is that a problem for Legacy? And if it does poorly, is that a problem for Legacy? So. You know, I think it could, it's so, it's very hard to predict. And I think I wouldn't want the job of trying to stay on top of Star Trek trends in terms of having to then decide what's going to be made next, except that I do because I'm bossy and have ideas. But you know what I mean? It's a lot of responsibility to try and figure out if, how do you have your finger on the pulse given how long it takes to make one of these shows too? Exactly. So uh, there's a little bit of merch news. I keep on talking about the Star Trek comics. We, we were having a Star Trek comics renaissance. This week, three different Star Trek comics were released. They launched a new Halloween-themed series called Halloween, H-O-L-O-Ween. Get it's, it? You know, it's a spooky holodeck TNG thing. Every week they're releasing a new issue through October, which is cool. And there's another Strange New Worlds comic book and another Defiant comic book, which is the Wharf one. They're carrying on after the you know big crossover event. So there's a lot of Star Trek content out there if you look at Star Trek comics. You know, dozens of issues this year. So it's great. Nice. Um, the review for Prodigy 1B, you know, the episodes 11 through 20, Blu-ray is on the site. These releases are good. I mean, it's great to have physical discs. It's the only way you could watch it. Um, I am disappointed with no audio commentaries, um, but there are, you know, and there's some nice special features. But the best thing is the show looks great on Blu-ray, and it's the only way to have the show except to buy it digitally, really. Yeah, I have not popped the discs in yet to watch, but I will. I'm excited. Well, speaking of animated Trek, we have the last... Very short Treks episode has gone up. And I have to say, it's called Walk, Don't Run. This should have been the first one. Absolutely. If they had released this one first, I think the whole bunch of them would actually have been seen quite differently. I would have started with this one and ended with Aaron's and put the other ones in the middle. Yeah, This is what it was supposed to be, which is a celebration of Star Trek animation and the, you know, Star Trek, the animated series. It's very meta. 
So Tendi is kind of talking to the audience, you know, Noelle Wells, about Star Trek the Animated Series, as if she knows she's on an animated show. Right. And then gets into an argument with Scotty, making fun of how he doesn't have normal eyeballs. And That and- was my favorite part of the whole thing because i was i didn't think it was great but i thought it was cute and i just thought when he says the lines were so good i had to write them down he says you know what's fat your big cartoon eyes and then she says at least i have whites in my eyes you just have black dots on your skin (laughs) it's still sweet and everyone comes together and there's music and george decay and and jonathan frank show up and they play a song and it's very 70s it's all great you know yeah if you watched any like dorky 70s cartoons there were always bands like the brady kids had a band and like a lot of those characters who had you know live action tv shows got bands once they were animated (laughs) so it's kind of a play on that it's a and it's a great they're great moments where they're like it's a stylistic choice like they do get into the meta-ness of the animated series it's it's actually kind of long for the short treks. It's like five minutes, eh? yeah, which is much longer than Aaron's was. But it's worth it because the song kind of goes on for a while. The song does not need to go on so long. But I do think that they, this one wasn't one joke over and over because they added, when you add details and other elements, it gets better. So yes, you could say the point of it was one thing, but each time they added a piece it was funnier. Like, I mean, I was like, oh, Scotty's mentioning an orgy, but then he's running around waving his pants in the air, which was funny. So I just, I do think that that would have been such a good setup. That's all. Indeed. So those are, you know, now in the can. Now, I was noticing on Memory Alpha, you know, they're, they're struggling a little bit with how to treat the show. <laughs> like characters like Assface and Screwhead are now listed as Enterprise crew people. But they shouldn't. Is, shouldn't that go in like Memory Beta? Isn't Memory Beta where they put the non canon Yeah, there things? is some kind of wording about how it's possibly fictional, but, you know, the, 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 it's, it's possibly <laughs> fictional or some, something like that. But it is it is, you know, the, the, this stuff is working its way into Memory Alpha, which I found interesting i mean it should in some way because that's where we all go for you know at some point i'll be like oh i need what was did screwdriver guy have a name and then i'll go look it up and i'll find it there whatever it is but it is you have to say it's not canon yeah there's the whole thing of it's an official product it is on screen which is usually the definition of canon versus a book or a comic book but they're acknowledging that it's not canon but yeah there is there is some de- debate, as it were. I, I love memory alpha debates. I know, but that's a, it's a weird debate because the people who made it said it's not. I mean, it literally says not canon yes. in the trailer. So. Yeah, so that's why I would say it's clear. Yeah. There are things that are perhaps un- like the animated series as a whole. There's been a lot of interesting debate about whether that's canon or not, and I think now we've decided it is. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> as weird as it gets. It's all and it gets weird uh speaking of animated things that are canon let's start talking about lower decks before <laughs> good we segue. get it, thank you um before we get into the episode there was a little bit there was a good interview with cinema blend with mike mcmahon talking about the future of the show and you know mike got real he's you know about season five and saying it might be the end and he says that you know without fan support like we've seen for prodigy and mentions letter writing campaigns and all that kind of stuff he's he doesn't know because of the current media landscape that there will be more after season five which i would say that every showrunner would say that about any show well i think things are a little different (laughs) unless if your show is a massive runaway hit that's different but i think that I mean, I'm not saying like, oh, how could, what a dumb thing for him to say. It's not a dumb thing to say, but it's not like, oh my God, really? Like, yeah, of course, they're working on season five. Their season six is not a given and things are shifting. I mean, I could have, all I'm saying is I could have given that interview and I would have said the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's acknowledging the reality of things. And he yes, mentions yes. Discovery ending, Picard is ending or ended, Prodigy was removed. He's seeing that as warning signs. Right. Smart. 
Yeah. I remember talking to Mike at the the launch party. I guess it was the, the summer of 2022 for season three. And he was very confident that, you know, the, the, you know, he was mostly concerned with season five of when were they going to give him the official green light so he could start spending money and hiring writers and, you know, and that kind of thing. He's obviously feeling differently now that he doesn't see it as a given at all. Yeah, well, a lot of things have shifted. I mean, I'm not, you know, like I'm agreeing with him, basically. Like I, a lot of things have changed. And his main point, I think, was don't wait till it's over and then protest and write a campaign, but support it while it's on. Right. Don't save the show that's been canceled. Right. Support the show before it's been canceled. So watch it and talk about it. And I have to say, I've seen a lot of stuff on social today, people being very pushy, like, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, I'm watching it, then I'm going to watch it again. I mean, it's a good call out because people uh, are doing it. That being said, five seasons is a good run. If it got six, it would actually be the most of any of the new Star Trek shows. I mean, Mike would obviously like to get seven because that's the next gen number that's the magic number <laughs> or more but uh because he did do tng season eight of course famously but i'm okay with five i hope when they are writing season five that they give it an ending that can handle it being the series finale just in case i think that that's a good run it could keep on going you know simpsons is what season are they up to like know, 30 35 or 50 yeah, no, yeah 30 yeah I certainly don't like I've seen some people say, well, you know, they should just use that money and do Star Trek legacy. I mean, that these that's you know, not are, how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's not how it works. It's certainly not the kind of scale of money. that no. it would take. But money is tight at Paramount and right. decisions need to be made. And five seasons is a long time. You know, maybe there's another different, interesting animated show that they mm-hmm. could do. Maybe. I mean, I'm very much in love with Lower Decks. So for me, I hope it continues. But the fact that they've created two animated Star Trek shows that I love means there could be a third one that I could love. Here's a question. If given a choice between season six of Lower Decks or them going back to doing short treks, kind of an anthology style short treks thing, which would you, which would be live action and a mix of live action and animation, which would you choose? It would depend who's in charge of the short treks. I don't mean Alex, but I mean like who's creatively making the. Well, let's say it's just someone you you know you like. It's not some you know it's the <laughs> equivalent of Mike McMahon, but for that, whoever that is. Oh, that would be cool. All right. I have to say, I take that. I take that bargain. Yeah. I take. I take the anthology show. Maybe you get the, you know you get the Captain Proton thing. Maybe that's animated. But I love anthology shows in general, and I think you know which was the you know Brian Fuller's original idea for discovery so i know the problem with anthology shows the the positive is also a negative like the freshness of every week also means like it's starting something new and so you're not retaining the same characters or necessarily the same actors and so that can make it harder to latch on depending on what it is yeah and again like i said it would very much depend on who's the creative person because as we know some of these shows i've had issues with and I get frustrated by and other ones I don't. So that's going to make or break. Even the short treks themselves, I do love the idea. I love that they experimented and made a bunch of them, but I didn't like all of them. But I still think it was a great experiment. I wish they had the budget to do stuff like that. That was a good question. I'm Yeah, I, I'm not saying these discussions are happening somewhere. No, no, no. You're being hypothetical. and Yeah. Also, you know, let's not have people saying, you know, Anthony Pascal calls for lower decks to end. You know, I'm just saying, you know, decisions get made, shows end. I already put that on Twitter. Anthony yeah. Pascal calls for lower decks to end. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Mike will be he's, happy about that. And this the subtitle, he's had enough. <laughs> enough. <laughs> no, I, we love lower decks. I do love lower decks. Let's talk about episode six of season four. With Dave Foley. I just want to say we've now had two of the five kids in the hall on Star Trek. So there are three more to go. I'd like to see them all get there at some point. Right. Scott was on Voyager. Yes, he was. (laughs) So there are three more. Let's get them all in there, please. Yeah, well, there's a 25-year gap between two of them. So I'm not sure. Well, so they should hurry up. Yeah, exactly. And it all ties in because Nicole DeBoer was on Kids in the Hall back in the day. But anyway, back to Lower Decks. My take on this, like, I thought it was fun. It's probably 
like it wasn't a strong episode given the, the rest of the season. I thought it was kind of weaker than the rest of them. Lots of fun stuff and fun little moments, but definitely a little bit to me sitcommy predictable. And then I was thinking about that and wondering if that was perhaps intentional because they're actually sitcoms in the episode also. Yeah, the show was in a bit meta. I mean, the biggest storyline, of course, is probably the Tendy Rutherford thing. And they were quite upfront about the will they, won't they, because one of the fake Ferengi TV shows was called Will They, Won't They. Right. And um, you know, we've been talking about it since season one, you know, of, of the you know, because they've clearly made those two close. It is hinted at a romance there. And so they confronted it in a big way in this episode by forcing them together to be a fake couple. Which it's, is like, again, the most sitcom y thing of all, because it's only on TV shows that, like, I have to do this thing with my crush where we pretend we're married. Like, when right. does that ever happen to anybody in real life? It doesn't, obviously. And they had to keep it going because there were actual stakes here because they yes. were on Ferenginar. And getting a discount fraudulently is is a huge felony, which could get you uh, sentenced to the salt mines or something like that. So they had, they had to keep it going. Yeah, and I did think that the specific, the way that it was escalated each time was hilarious. Like, just as they go, you know what, let's go back to the ship and then spotlight. And then <laughs> the thing right. at the at the dinner, I just thought, like, first of all, the photo shoot, I was like, okay. And then the thing at the dinner was very, very funny. Like, now you have to say what you find most attractive about the other person. And the chair can tell if you're lying. And you have to tell the whole restaurant. <laughs> and, and I mean, if you listen closely, there's like they have game show sound effects and music while, during that segment. And it was all set. In what was essentially Star Trek The Experience, except it was yes. called Quark's Starfleet Experience. Yes. Although mo very TOS focused. Although there were some TNG characters, but it was very T. You know, you had the Bugatu and the Guardian of Forever and, you know, stuff like that. And the Velour uniforms. The Velour that catch fire sometimes. Yeah, the visit to Ferenginar in general was just a lot of fun, I thought. Yes, they, they, they had a lot of fun honoring the Ferengi and having fun with the Ferengi on Ferenginar because there's, as Mariner says, they are very on brand. Like the, the Dominion War Memorial was for lost prophets, yes. not lost lives. If you're looking, I don't know how much you were, but it, you know, when you're just looking at the signs around for things, my favorite was Uncle Quark's Youth Casino. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I did. I loved all the stuff. I loved all the stuff that took place there. And they're still doing that thing that they do so well, which we talked about last week, which is that they honor old canon and add to it at the same time in a flawless way. Right. Like m many rules of acquisition were mentioned, but they created a new rule. Yeah. Rule number eight, which is a great, you know, so getting back to a different storyline. What's good about this episode, all the stories were wrapped together. So you had a Freeman storyline, a Mariner storyline, a Boimler storyline, and a Tendy Rutherford storyline. And they had to keep all of them going. And they were all linked to this visit to Ferenginar. Plus they had kind of a, you know, sub subplot again of the season arc happening where that was heating up as well. So they were spinning a lot of plates this episode, mm -hmm. which is why I think there were some pacing issues because they were really juggling quite a lot. But I did, you know, the the Freeman storyline I thought was strong, even though the kind of Admiral character was... Yeah, it was the most... Not it was kind of the most sitcom because you saw it all from the first... The as soon as that dynamic began, you knew where everything was going and what was going to happen. That he was going to think it was easy and get tricked and that she would be the one who who was going to save the day and knew what was going on and she respected you know and understood Ferengi customs yes because she's been doing all these second contacts so she understands uh you know cultural issues and obviously we've seen lame admirals in star trek before but he was just an idiot i mean yes and feckless and you, you wonder like how could someone this bad be an admiral Right. With that spineless, he had no backbone at all. But you know, the one good thing is in the end, he's like, oh, you know, you were right. I was wrong. I'll tell Starfleet. Right. 
what did you think of because this storyline brought back chase masterson and max grodenchik as rom and lita it was interesting what they did with rom here where they really played up especially the early seasons version of rom the kind of dumb brother bartender thing i thought from the beginning it was clear he was play acting and and in fact, Captain Freeman says they're doing good cop, bad copper. Mm-hmm. Right? But there was a lot of Rom playing dumb. And we didn't get a lot of what we saw at the end when he was nuanced and speaking more eloquently right. and being more grand agacy. It felt like even though it was play acting, we weren't seeing the evolution of the character. You know, What do you think? I think some people will have a problem with that. I mean, I felt like the evolution was more in the larger story when they said that they've applied just the, even that they'd applied to be members of the federation that the friend have changed the way they do things which they established at the beginning before that ship was destroyed to me was already showing the evolution like of some follow-up to that story where he's the nagus right i mean the captain of that ship believed in his v- yeah, new vision right. all the women had clothes on you know the you know so He's obviously had a huge impact on Ferengi society. Right. I'm really just talking about his performance. His performance and, you know, he's playing with the baseball and hitting himself in the head. I mean, he was really acting up being an idiot, basically. Right. And it's a comedy show. Yeah. I mean, for those reasons, it didn't I thought it was funny. Okay. And it didn't cool. bother me. And I liked when when he was just call me Nagus. Okay, Nagus. Grand Nagus. Like that <laughs> made me laugh. Yeah. His performance was good. Uh, Chase was great as Lita, especially how she she's now first clerk and she knows her way around a contract. She's smart. Yeah. No, I mean, they missed the thing at the end, which is funny, but she they have a thing. They have a little routine going. I feel like it honored Deep Space Nine. It honored the characters. We got an important follow up because. There was so much happening at the end of Deep Space Nine. It's good to see where these characters ended up. I mean, it would have been nice to get an update on Brunt, maybe, and some other stuff. I mean, but there's only so much you can. Yeah, they they certainly didn't need to squeeze something else into this. There was a lot going on. I mean, there was so much Ferengi diss. One of my favorite details is not only did they lay out grub worms on the table for snacks, in the honeymoon suite, they had shaped pillows like two grub worms kissing each other. <laughs> it's just so much a detail like that. I loved actually in the conference room, the enterprise cheese board, <laughs> because I, I think I, I mean, I have, I have a ship's cheese board <laughs> and I, and a Picard cheese board. So Star Trek cheese boards are a thing and now they're canon, but they also exist in my house. <laughs> But I feel like the thing, there's a lot of of character stuff. So you have a lot of like jokes and plot and stuff like that. But we also had, like, I feel like we've had some some good sort of course corrections over the season, maybe for Freeman and Ransom, who haven't sort of lost who they were. But we definitely understand that they are good at their jobs now in a stronger way than I think we used to the season. Right. Ran- Ransom is doing a great job shepherding these lieutenants. Yeah. Much, much to the chagrin of Mariner. who <laughs> It's annoying her how good he is at it. Well, that was my first laugh out loud in this episode was when she said, why is it so weird when you're nice? And he said, because I'm also so handsome. Total package and points at her as he's walking out. And that made me laugh out loud. But yes, like it's also... We have them that we understand are are better officers than we thought they were when the show started seasons ago. And then I also think like the Boimler and Mariner are still both really wrestling with their promotions. Like Boimler is still the same guy he was. So he is stuck in his old ways of like overdoing it, trying to prove, trying to take on more than is reasonable, Miss sometimes missing the point. And then we have Marina, who's in a total full-on identity crisis. Yeah. They brought back Quimp from episode two, voiced by Tom Kenny, who's alleged. I mean, it's amazing that SpongeBob voices these off characters. You I know. know. Like, why do, he doesn't need to do that, I think, you know, but he's doing it and he's great. But this time it was good because Quimp obviously has known Mariner for years and sees her pattern of 
self-sabotage and her bar crawl. He wants to have a quiet brunch and she's pounding Dagger drinks. of the minding it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Starting a bar fight in the casino, which was the uh, Ferengi library. Yes. Uh, he was great, but I do work like, like it was funny watching Mariner. She's got her Ferengi hat with the double. That was great. So there was a lot of good comedy, but this, Mariner constantly self-sabotage thing. I mean, maybe that's the point, but she's constantly resetting herself. Like she learns a lesson every episode and then forgets it the next episode. I guess they're they're waiting for the season to end for her to finally have the epiphany and say, you know what? Maybe it's okay that I'm a lieutenant and I can grow and change and I don't have to be this cool rebel, um, although she'll keep her sleeves rolled up eternally, I imagine. I hope so. But she sits in chairs the wrong way. You know, that's the that's kind of how you know story. she's. Yeah, because she sits in chairs wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I did feel like this was something of an this was an escalation to me, because like the last time we sort of saw her misbehaving was the Moopsie episode. Right. Was when she was truly misbehaving. And that's because she misheard something and assumed that she was going to be sabotaged. And in this case, now she's wrestling with the with the truth which is she's not, she has support and she's not going to be sabotaged and she's valued. And that is a, is a different struggle for her. I guess my concern is the writers know how to create comedy out of Mariner creating chaos. Cause we've seen this in sitcoms where characters end up in a rut and they don't evolve because it's easy to get the laughs out of them saying their signature taglines, et cetera. And Mariner's chaos is funny. Every, you know, everything in her storyline was funny, except that it, you know, feels like she's spinning her wheel. So I, I you know, maybe I'm overthinking it. No, I, I don't think you're overthinking. But for me, it, it wasn't at the same level. It's not a reset to me. It's okay. it's actually a nuanced escalation, because this time when you're watching her pick that fight, it's the most obvious that she has no justification at all, like the guy is saying, I'm so sorry. Even though he's huge. He's gigantic. And he says, well, I was just hanging out with my biker gang friends. And I'm so sorry. I feel bad. And she's completely unhinged at this point. She, yeah. She throws the punch after learning the big guy has a biker gang. Yes. No, so there, yeah, she has no filter. So I felt like it was an escalation and, and almost a crisis point for her. Oh, it absolutely was a crisis point, which is. And and the fact that Ransom, of course, doesn't understand and she knows he doesn't understand. So she's I feel like she's got to figure it out now. But it it does feel like we're going we're moving in a specific direction with her. Yeah. Unfortunately, no one else saw her go through this because Boimler had his own crisis where he <laughs> was able to let go, I guess, of his ridiculous agenda, which you could read. Um, on his, uh, you know, yes. and ended up just sitting in his hotel room watching Ferengi TV, which Ransom thought was good, actually. Right. I mean, he didn't have, he was kind of the D story. Yeah. The best parts of that were just the T, you know, the, the fake. Uh, the fake shows. Right. Why does everyone in the Ferengi TV show, though, wear like 20th century American clothing, right? Suits and ties. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I mean, it was basically the office, right? And then kind of. Then the landlord cops were basically a 70s cop show. Right. And the commercials. There was a very subtle Easter egg in there where he's watching the commercial. And then, oh, and then there's a, the Sluggo Cola uh, thing in the middle of the cop show. And he laughs at, oh, the, it's like mind control. But right behind him, there's a painting like the Paramount logo and it sparkles when he says that. I noticed that after you mentioned it in your review, and then I went and rewatched that bit. And I was like, oh, good eye, Tony. I did not notice that when I watched it the first time. I, I didn't notice it the first time, but the second time, the sparkling really I, you know, gets you because yeah. his head is right, right <laughs> yeah, in the right middle. right there. Yep. Very meta. And then character wise, like, because I was thinking about Tendi and Rutherford. And I mean, they were both adorable and I did enjoy their bad sweetheart names for each other were just so dopey but i was trying to like because the moment that kind of threw them off was they're making all these jokes about all these things they're gonna do to show what a couple they are and then she talks about wearing his shorts and walking around topless so i felt like either that was like super sitcom-y because it seemed like such a weird thing 
for her to say and that's what threw them off like she accidentally took it to the wrong level but i thought maybe they're trying to show us that she has not had a relationship yet and that's why she really has no idea <laughs> like it's such a weird thing to say like then i'm gonna walk around topless it's it's an odd thing to throw into the mix they're so, both obviously in love with each other and both obviously have no idea what to do with it right everyone can see it but them i mean i hope that they work this out because otherwise it, it makes them clueless and they would be a great couple, obviously. Right. Well, they would if they just relaxed, because obviously they have they do finish each other's equations, equations and things yeah. like that. But it was such a like, I think they're trying to establish that also, I, I guess they haven't. I mean, we know he dated, but I guess they haven't had relationships before, which is why the minute they contemplate when it gets very awkward. I did like when he said that he was trying to think of a less intense adjective than captivating. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was as soon as she goes oh well, walk around topless i'm like oh <laughs> that's what that's what turned them to wanting to give it all up in a totally separate thing but at the beginning they keep on working on this shuttle called sequoia and it's kind of evolving over the seasons like there was a subtle thing that boimler said so mariner another reference was she was working on a self-sealing stem bolt right and Boimler joked how if she keeps on weathering it, it won't self steal seal anymore. So is the idea that they're trying to they're trying to make this shuttle look weathered and more like that's part of what they're doing, I think, right? Oh, I've never paid that much attention to what they're doing. Well, it's never really they've never really explained. They've never flown the shuttle. They're adding things to it. They paint things on it. Why do they even let them have a shuttle as like a little personal hobby? you know, when they were ensigns, but I'm just wondering if the shuttle's ever going to be, if it's just going to be this running gag where they never finish, but I don't even like, what are they doing? What is their goal here to make it fly again or just to play with it? I it's guess. a good question. Save that question for the next time we get to ask questions. <laughs> these are the things that I think about. These, these are second viewing things though. Yeah. For sure. Sometimes third viewing things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did my other laugh out loud moment that came at the beginning was Boimler saying, I'm just so excited to haggle at the Museum of Gambling. Oh, and gamble at the Museum of Haggling, which just made me bark. <laughs> it was a very Simpsons-y kind of joke. Yes, but good. Funny. Yes. Well, it made me laugh. So that was good. And I also liked at the end, can I interest you in our homewrecker package for Dr. Reglimo? <laughs> and that whole bit at the end was just... Again, sitcom-y, but weird and fun and good. Right, because they were, Miglimo came in and said, they're famously, yeah. you know, <laughs> the most. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, would have got them thrown into Ferengi prison. So Tendi acted fast. She was very yeah. smart, saying that they had a three-way and tied it into the discount. It was all very smart. Yeah, you smart. couldn't bring, t you couldn't have a thruple at <laughs> the discount. <laughs> <laughs> What did Miglo said when he was offered the um he was offered the home wrecker package and he said you didn't need to throw that up in my mouth twice or something yeah, like that. It's all that which is second week in a row where he's referencing regurgitated food cuz he's a bird. He said his species went into space to search strange new meals. So yes. this is he's a foodie. That's a new He thing is, for but he likes it to be regurgitated and spit into his mouth. He is a bird. That is yes. his thing. He's, you know, again, Paul F. Tompkins, you know, the, the, the voice talent on this show is so good. I know. It's so, so good. All the guests were excellent. Any other eggs or references or things you found fun? Uh, I liked the, the for-profit toilet along with the machines that charge you to pay for the toilet. Well, I mean, we saw you know, we've seen in the visit to Ferengi homeworld, those little things that they keep all around where you have to pay strips of latinum for everything. Right. Every little every little thing, which seems very inefficient, by the way. You'd think they'd have worked out something like Apple Pay with the watch or something like that. I know. I mean, we how have many for the strips can you carry around on you for you think it would be heavy? 
Yeah. Yeah. For the amount of things you need to pay for on Ferenginar. I did notice when our lieutenants went on their trip that they had your favorite little cylinder bags. God, I hate those things. (laughs) (laughs) I want to buy you one because you hate them so much. I also liked the uh, the Moab 4 dome joke, which was a reference to the Masterpiece Society. (laughs) And I love that there's a ship called the Toronto. Hello. That made me very happy. Another Parliament class ship, which are kind of the fancy versions of the Cerritos, all named after Canadian cities. Yay. And I actually thought, I was wondering this, so when, when Lita mentions the friends and family discount, I think it was for the invoice for the bust of Good Fortune. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> it kind of made me think like friends and family discount. I just immediately thought of those MCI commercials that the TOS crew used to do because it was the friends and fit back in the day when you oh, could right, get right, friends right. and family discounts for long distance plans. And I know because I had them. They did a commercial with a whole bunch of the TOS crew. And then at the end, Jonathan Frakes shows up and they're like, how did you get in here? And there's all these people cheering in a room. Yay! But uh, I wondered if it was a reference to that, perhaps. Possibly. I mean, I was wondering whether the whole faking a romance to fool a Ferengi was possibly like when Picard had to pretend he was in love with Loxana Troy. Yep. Or, or that's just a coincidence. Who knows? You never know with this show. Right. I mean, some things are obvious. Like the title itself is a play on a somewhat obscure British comedy called Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which is impossible to describe. Just look it up. Find it out there. You can find it out there. And it's hilarious. It's just amazing. But it's very much a cult comedy. Yeah, I've never heard of it. We learned a little bit more about Mar- why Mariner's been demoted before. Apparently, sometime in her past, she crashed or caused the crash of an Oberth class starship. Right. Maybe that was back when she had that big hairdo. Remember? <laughs> the- <laughs> she- <laughs> um, I also like that they did they put them on travel guide duty because uh, Dayton Ward has done, I think, at least two actual travel. Like there are travel guides out there. There's one for the Klingon Empire and one for Vulcan. I'm not sure if there are any others yet. There could be one for Ferenginar now because now we we know all sorts of places on yeah. Ferenginar. There's the Slugonasium where they do boxing. <laughs> There's the Museum of Gambling, the Museum of Haggling, Loeb's Lodge, the Maximum Romax Rub Dungeon. There were things on Boimler's list too. Yeah, I mean, there's enough for uh, for a fresh guide for sure. There was a <laughs> there was an ad for a cologne, poor ohm called a choir <laughs> yeah this is gonna keep all of you easter eggs people very busy Indeed. there were a lot of things in there let's um talk about the season plot it it, it heated up a bit there was a yeah i think a major development this week so you know like we've seen before some lower deckers on a ship this time a ferengi ship we start off with them and then the ship gets attacked and uh, appears to be destroyed. Um, and but this time, the, one of them seemed to know about it. Chief, one of the lower deckers, and the yes. captain didn't trust him. Was going to kick him out the airlock, but yeah, he he said they told me there was going to be profit in it. He knew the attack was coming. He said right on time when the attack came. It may not be that he knows what's happening exactly, but the attackers, the mystery ship, has been in contact with him. So here's a question. Has this actually been true every time? Because one of the things about the ship is they're able to disable all the systems, right? So right. do they have these insiders sabotaging, lower deckers helping them sabotage all of these ships? I mean, I feel like I'd need to go back and watch the scenes again, but certainly in the scenes we saw, everybody seemed surprised. Yeah. I mean, we haven't got a hint of this before, but... Why just this Ferengi? Unless, I mean, one could say, well, maybe it's a Ferengi behind all of this, but I'm not sure that. I don't think that would be so exciting. And it doesn't really make sense either. So why were the Ferengi the only, this Ferengi the only one? It just, it just could be that we didn't notice before, but that they've been using insiders all along. Who knows? You know, but yeah, it's, I feel like we should go back and have another look at some of those scenes and see if there's anything we've missed. But this was the whole reason why Frangie was 
asking to join the Federation. You know, so this is this story is becoming more and more linked, but it's not overwhelming. Certainly, the episodic nature of the show. It's more like a catalyst. It's still. Right. It's not in the background, but it's not in the foreground yet. It's, it's right where I want it. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect it's not really going to be in the foreground foreground until the final episode. Yeah. Or may, maybe starting with the one before. We'll see. Yeah. So we've got four left. Oh. I haven't watched ahead. I don't know. No, me you... neither. I'm not watching ahead at all. I'm very excited for the rest of the season. Yeah, me too. Like if this is what I thought was probably the weakest one. I still thought it was really funny and good. You know, I I want season six and seven if this is as bad as it gets. Yes, exactly. And I'm not saying it's bad. And it's not bad. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Yeah. So Anthony Pascal wants more Lower Decks. I just want to be on the record (laughs) for that. This just in. (laughs) Revised headline. (laughs) Do we have anything else to, uh, to say about this? Nope. All right. Well, then let's wrap up with our bits of the week. You should start. I think I mentioned this before um, in passing, but uh, the uh, UCLA has renamed a theater, the Crest Theater, and redesigned, rebuilt it in Westwood to be this new performing arts center called the Nimoy Theater after Leonard Nimoy. And it's opened up. There was an opening event. I didn't get a chance to go. Apparently, Quinto went. Yeah, my friend Bonnie was there who knew Leonard and is close to the family and knows is friends with Michael Westmore and all these people. And she went and wrote a beautiful um, description of the event on Facebook. There's some good pictures of the theater on the inside from L.A. Magazine. My my favorite thing is that as you leave, there's this this giant sign above the all of the exits that says live long and prosper. And it's beautiful. It's like this art deco lettering, right? Like at, yeah, I looked at yeah. the pictures. It's very beautiful. Yeah, and all the kind of, you know, dignitaries from UCLA were pictured in front of it giving the Vulcan salute. So they're definitely having some Nimoy fun with the Nimoy Theater. And they're already at it. You know, there's all these interesting cultural events happening there. That's great. You know, there's one in New York. There's a Leonard Nimoy Theater in New York. And the Patrick Stewart talk was right in the same building, but in the other theater. So there are two theaters in Symphony Space, and one is the Nimoy one. And we are wishing, as we were standing in line, we saw, like, you can see pictures of Leonard Nimoy. And we're like, I wish we were going to be in that theater, because that would be so poetic. Wow. Yeah. Small Star Trek world we live in. Yes. Well, my bit of the week is an oldie, but a goodie. I did not. This is something, again, related to Patrick Stewart, because Brian told me about this while we were sitting waiting for the show to start and sent me the link. And I decided it's the greatest video I've ever seen in my life related to Star Trek. But it is um, an extra that was done uh, in 2008 for the for a bonus disc on the TNG Blu-ray set or Trek movie. Not sure which it was. Um, but it's William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, Patrick Stewart, and Jonathan Frakes in a discussion hosted by Whoopi Goldberg. And it's called The Captain's Summit. And it is over an hour long. It is so full of glorious moments. Like William Shatner saying, I've never seen the next generation and they'll give him a hard time. Um, Whoopi talks about how she was never invited to a con. She hasn't been invited yet. And they're like, we'll hook you up, we'll hook you up. But Patrick Stewart talks about asking Jonathan Frakes to kneel on the floor for a shot he was directing because he didn't know how else to get him in the shot. And they're all laughing. Shatner recreates his react. Like Leonard Nimoy goes, show them what your reaction was when you found out I was going to direct a Star Trek movie. (laughs) And then it's just, (laughs) it's so good to, they, they all, they kind of give each other a hard time. They're funny. They're all so smart. It's such a fascinating conversation to watch. I could have another thing I could have happily watched many hours of. So we will put up a link to it, but really take a little time. It's worth it and watch the whole thing. It's amazing to me that that even happened. And apparently it's uh, these things were created for these discs and then that's it. Like we're lucky that that someone put them on YouTube. There's a lot of great special features for uh, some of those uh, next gen. I think those were the first HD releases i'm not sure it's definitely before like leonard nimoy knew anything about being in new star trek movies well he was hired in 2007 so but maybe this was recorded before that 
I think it must have been because they do talk about the movies quite a bit. Unless he just couldn't say anything. Because it, it wasn't revealed until Comic-Con. Yeah. So, but I forget which Comic-Con. If it, I think it was 2008. The same year that this came, thing came out. Right. <laughs> wow, we are really in the weeds. It's time to say <laughs> Call goodbye. Call it a day, yes. <laughs> All right, I'll go uh, listen to the Strange New Worlds musical some more. And that'll be my evening. <laughs> And I'm going to watch the next week's episode of Lower Decks to get ready for next week's podcast. All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs>